Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Helen Hall. Don Griffin and I coordinate webinars for IEEE USA. If you have any questions about our webinar process, please send us an email. Glad to get to respond to you. As a reminder, there will, be, there will be more webinars added to our schedule throughout the year, so please continue to visit our website to see what's available. And before I introduce our presenter, uh, please type your questions in the chat pod as we go through the presentation. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end to type your questions in. Uh, Mr. Hutchins will respond to you once he sees your question in the chat pod. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, recorded webinars and slides will be on our website of, uh, within a few days. Our presenter today is Greg Hutchins. Greg is the principal engineer with Quality Plus Engineering. Quality Plus Engineering is certified under the Department of Homeland Security Safety Act for critical infrastructure protection, forensics, assurance, and analytics. The firm conducts risk audits and vulnerability assessments for critical structure such as cybersecurity, power utilities, and critical product suppliers. Greg is the developer of value-added auditing and the critical infrastructure technology. He is a prolific writer on technology risk management. He has been a columnist for IEEE, PMI, ASQ, and many other technology associations. Greg has written over a thousand books, including ISO 9000, Supply Management Strategies, and Operational Audits, which was translated into eight languages. I present to you, Greg. <laughs> Hi, Helen. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, if I'm hoping everybody can hear me. So I'm basically getting a couple comments that says there might be some clicking. Uh, I hope it's not from our end. <laughs> anyway, uh, the second I need to take care of some um, housekeeping. First of all, um, thank you very much for being on. Secondly, we're going to basically send you a survey uh, on this webinar, and we'd like to have your thoughts. So uh, Helen's going to send it to you after the workshop, after the webinar, and uh, please uh, send it to us. You know, your candid comments would be uh, very much appreciated. Uh, the other thing for housekeeping is some thank yous. Uh, first to Vin O'Neill, the godfather and the genius who pulled this together. Uh, Helen Hall uh, <laughs> for teaching you this lot I'd had a webinar. And then, uh, I guess, my stakeholders, my bosses, Hank Lindborg, uh, chair of CWPC, Ed Perkins, uh, incoming uh, IEEE board member, Lynn Koblen, Tom Lynch, and Paul Kostick. Uh, <laughs> Paul, I guess, is the uber IEEE um, counselor that advises certainly me on what to do and how to do it. So thank you all. So first, a little story. About uh, 15 years ago, I was on the board of the Project Management Institute. Institute at that time had about 30,000 members. And I, we, a lot of the folks on the board of, I, of PMI looked at project management basically as a scheduling tool. It was essentially a hammer in search of a nail. And we thought PMI wasn't going to grow much more than 30,000, 40,000 members. Well, the bottom line is right now PMI, Project Management Institute's 300, 400,000, it's global. What happened? The executive director of PMI at that time, who was brand new, saw project management as a life tool, something that everyone needed to know how to do. And as an engineer, I thought of, again, uh, project management as a hammer, largely a technical hammer. But with all the outsourcing, with all the insourcing, with a lot of people becoming you know, what I would call itinerant professionals, project management and project work became very, very popular, and PMI obviously picked it up. We think the same thing about risk management. It's going to be a tool that all professionals need, but probably more importantly, it's actually the primary filter for almost all decision making especially in these times of constrained resources and the critical question of who gets and who pays. 
we think that issue of who gets who pays is a risk management decision. So anyway, we're going to basically launch into our webinar. A little background on who we are. Um, boy, we've been in business for about 20 years. We started out in quality, uh, quality profession, wrote about 12 books about quality. And for probably the last five or six years, I've been evangelizing that the future of quality is risk management. Uh, <laughs> so in the meantime, we've developed a bunch of products. We've developed some IP. Uh, a lot of it has basically been picked up by Homeland Security. Our client list is on the right. Um, largely, what we've been doing, and this is a little interesting story, um, about three, four years ago, Ed Perkins and I had finished a job for the legislature looking at an IT project. It was a state data center, and it basically was a risky project. It wasn't meeting its schedule, its cost, its scope, and there were a lot of problems dealing with governance, technology governance. About two months later, the governor's office called and said, hey, listen, can you basically do an audit of our cybersecurity? So we went in, met with them, and they were saying, not only do we want an audit, but we want to have somebody sign off, meaning warranty, all the cybersecurity in the, in the state, state of Oregon. <laughs> well, bottom line, you can't do that. Uh, cybersecurity, almost all IT systems are notoriously uh, penetrable, and it's like you know <laughs> Swiss cheese. But it became an intriguing question. The state data, data center and the state, uh, what I would call cybersecurity, were, were critical infrastructure. And we, as well as about anybody else in the country, needed to have a mechanism by which to evaluate, attest, and assure. Bottom line, oh, <laughs> uh, and we spent a little time getting this. We got this conformance that you see in front of you, which basically says that if we assure any type of SIP, critical infrastructure, uh, we insure it and assure it against acts of terrorism. So we're going to see a lot more of that, and this will become a critical piece of our webinar today. So today we're going to cover really four topics. Increasing complexity, uncertainty, volatility, which essentially are all risk issues. We're going to look at what's happening in critical infrastructure, as well as the electric power sector. And then we're going to look at why ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, is a method, is, is becoming the method to manage risks in most CIP. And then we'll finish off with some lessons learned. So let's look at this slide for a second. What's the common denominator that you see with all of these? BP, British Petroleum, obviously had a blowout in the Gulf, Catast catastrophic. Toyota, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say about Toyota. We've had a lot of Toyota cars that I've bought, and uh, they grew too large and maybe a little bit too arrogant. But the bottom line was they had a problem, and their market cap their value on the marketplace basically plummeted. Uh, the third slide on the bottom left hand corner is a slide of what happened in the stock market about two months ago. The market basically dipped a thousand points in less than 30 minutes. And then on the bottom right hand side is the power grid. And we're going to be talking about the power grid a lot this morning. So let's first look at what happened. And this is my interpretation of what happened with British Petroleum. Engineers rec recommended additional mud around um, the, the well. Mud essentially is concrete that's put around the mud to encase the uh, methane that, is, that could come out up through the well. And then they recommended a backup blowout preventer and a couple other goodies. The bottom line is management wanted control of scope, schedule, and cost and basically didn't listen to the engineers. The result was a huge risk, both known and unknowable. The bottom line is BP managers basically accepted the risk of not putting in the additional mud, the additional blowout preventers. And the bottom line was we had that catastrophe down in the Gulf. 
awful, just simply awful. This is what happened with Toyota, at least my interpretation, and we've been in the auto industry for 20 some odd years, so this is probably a pretty educated guess. The engineers at Toyota basically focused on the software and the pedal, the mechanics and the pedal. Managers at Toyota focused on processes, Lean, Six Sigma, a couple other processes. And the bottom line is at the management didn't pay any attention and simply said we would accept the risks. Now I think the common denominator both to BP and Toyota was the engineers didn't have sufficient credibility cachet to basically or maybe you didn't even talk the language of management because they weren't listened to. In the meantime the result was catastrophic for Toyota, lost a lot of market value, lost a lot of its <laughs> Uh, quality credibility and lost market share and obviously revenue. For BP, well, who knows if BP is going to survive? Uh, they've got a $20 billion trust fund that they've set up, uh, <laughs> and the final numbers could be over $100 billion. And if that happens, chances are BP may cease to exist, largely because of a common problem engineers weren't listened to. And that might be a lack of credibility. It could be a lack of not speaking the language of management. It could be a lack of access to management. But the bottom line, I think, was management accepted the risks without fully understanding the risks. And the engineers didn't communicate that properly. So what are the common themes? Well, the common themes, I guess, to BP, the market dropping a thousand points, uh, Toyota, is we had a catastrophic event that was really a low likelihood. I don't think anybody, anybody, especially myself regarding Toyota quality, would have thought that this would have happened. And what we call catastrophic, very low likelihood events, sometimes called tail effects, are black swan events. For example, what are the chances of your seeing a black swan? Well, genetically, most swans are white, so the chance of your seeing a black swan are basically infinitesimally small. Now, the root causes were, I think, poor understanding of the problem by management, meaning likelihood and consequence. I think that with the constrained resources and with the time to drill uh, the well, with Toyota having a desire to, you know, capture additional market share, um, risk basically was simply accepted. And I think senior management really didn't understand what they were looking at and what they were accepting. And the other the day also, it was a technology challenge. Even though the heads of Toyota, the heads of BP are engineers, petroleum engineers and auto engineers, when you're looking at the forest, Sometimes you forget about what the knot hole in the tree is like, and the engineers who are looking at the knot hole in the tree certainly weren't understanding the catastrophic consequences of what would happen if there were a catastrophic failure and what that meant to the company, to the shareholders, and to the users, essentially. So basically, a couple things. Um, engineering credibility, I think, was questioned. I think the engineers were looking at point solutions as opposed to looking at process or enterprise solutions. And finally, they didn't look at what the enterprise, they didn't communicate to senior management, the executives, what the possible risks were. And that's going to be a critical feature, obviously, in a continuing <laughs> uh, point throughout this webinar. So here's two quotes, and I think you can read them yourselves. They're both very recent. The one on the left basically was a survey that was done through IBM that was quoted in um, Business Week. And uh, 1,500 CEOs were, uh, were uh, interviewed for the survey. And the bottom line is they're seeing much more complexity at the global level, at the enterprise level, at the process, and at the transactional product level. And there needs to be a, a, a method to basically integrate those three levels, 
the enterprise, the process programmatic, as well as the product level. And we believe, obviously, the way to integrate those is going to be through enterprise risk management. The quote on the right, basically, Harvard Business Review last year had three major issues focusing on one thing, how to manage risk. And the bottom line is they believe that over the next 10 years, every critical business issue is going to be reframed in terms of risk, mitigation, and subsequent control. So here's, yeah, I came across this about, oh, six months ago. I obviously don't speak Chinese, but a friend of mine brought this to my attention. And she basically said that risk is really two things, upside opportunity and downside danger. Now, most of us in the Western culture focus on the downside, the danger, and we try to come up with controls. But really, when you look at risk, risk is cost benefit, risk benefit, and essentially upside opportunity. So here's the second part of the work of the webinar, SIP and electric power risks, because that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And frankly, that's where our company is spending most of its time, largely driven by statute, rules, and regs. So let me get a couple uh, <laughs> key definitions and taken care of. One is critical infrastructure and key resources, CIKRs. There's 18 sectors that the feds have recognized as being critical infrastructure. They cover chemicals, biological, radiological, roads, bridges, transportation. And part of it is obviously power, the grid and its resources. And uh, oh yes, <laughs> Helen basically sent me a little note. If you've got questions, please just ask them. Type it into the presenter chat pod on your lower right-hand side, and I'll address that as I'm going through the slides. Uh, the CIKR essentially is called critical infrastructure. And what we're seeing are statutes now coming up almost monthly, basically dealing with how to protect, protect domestic infrastructure. I think the current thinking out of Washington is uh, we're going to be leaving Afghanistan <laughs> and uh, Iraq pretty shortly. Why? Uh, the war hopefully is going to be over, the wars. Um, uh, the costs are simply too high, and maybe they're even unwinnable. So the bottom line is we want to protect our domestic infrastructure. It's interesting. Most of the CIP issues, critical infrastructure protection, are basically being framed, are being discussed in terms of public safety. Public safety essentially trumps all public policy issues. And we'll talk about this in a minute and I'll give you a couple examples of that. Even computer aggression is basically part of what we would call uh, asymmetric warfare. So a couple of things. We recommended that the attendees, participants to the workshop webinar, basically see the 60 Minutes program that came out, Cyber War, June 13th, about three weeks ago. Well, now it's almost a month ago. Uh, and then the other thing we recommend is take a look at two books, must read. One, and they're a little bit geeky, but again, I think <laughs> I think they're a, they're a good read. One is called Cyber War. Richard Clark used to be the White House czar for technology and cybersecurity. And he's been on the road on TV, C-SPAN, basically saying that the future warfare isn't going to be two large armies going after each other. Essentially, it's going to be uh, small folks using the Internet to gain control of critical infrastructure or penetrating the grid. Second book is called The Black Swan came out about a year ago, great book, basically talks about, well, actually it came out about three years ago now, basically talks about events that are unknown, unknowable, tail effects, basically the ones that have are very high consequence and infinitesimally small likelihood. Great books. Anyway, let's, let's sort of look at one of these goodies. The Economist last week, July 2nd, 
basically had a cover issue dealing with cyber attack risk. And you can basically take a look at this quote that I pulled out. Really interesting quote, and it brings up a couple things. One, the threats of what we would call a digital attack are very real. Second is the attacks aren't just simply after information. They're actually going after the control mechanisms for utilities, power stations, generating stations, even air traffic control. And that's the big challenge. And that's the big challenge for engineers and also for electrical engineers, the solution. Because that's within our domain. It deals with communications, power grid, controls, and SIP. The other thing that's very interesting is this is brand new. And right now, there are no rules of engagement in this space. It's largely going to be defined probably over the next 20 years. And here's another quote from The Economist a week ago. Um, there are 18 CIP sectors, anything from transportation to air, ground transportation, bridges, water. And the common denominator to all CIP is control systems, SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. And the new standards and new laws that are coming out this month all deal with controlling, mitigating the risk of somebody penetrating or discovering the vulnerabilities to these control systems. And I think that's the opportunity for us, engineers, electrical engineers, control experts, to make a difference, gain employment, and basically have a lot of fun and do good at, <laughs> at the same time. Um, the picture on the right, it's a little scary, but it was, again, borrowed from The Economist uh, two weeks ago. Another thing, if you have a chance, is take a look at Homeland Security Presidential Directive number 7. It requires risk assessments of every possible infrastructure, piece of infra infrastructure. Now, right now, the feds own 15% of the critical infrastructure. The other 85% largely is in the public domain. And the laws that are coming out this month, we'll discuss those in a minute, basically give the feds the authority to control public as well as private infrastructure. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to cause a lot of, uh, <laughs> it's going to cause a lot of uh, uh, interest. Okay. So uh, here are the electric, let's talk about the electric power industry challenges. Um, the power industry is dealing with really four issues. One is CIP, cybersecurity, smart grid, and controls. And new laws are being enacted on each one of those. And we can talk about those. Smart grid. The Smart Grid Act just came out last month. It's an acronym for Grid Reliability and Infrastructure Defense Act. Uh, it's <laughs> the utilities and there's about 2,400, well, 3,400 utilities in North America. They really fought this one hard. Why? They said, where's the value? Uh, this is our model. This is in the private sector, not in the federal sector. Uh, the bottom line was they fought it on the Hill very, very hard, and the feds passed it last month. It was interesting. Largely bipartisan. It was a voice vote. And I think of the Senate, there were no dissenting votes. And the bottom line is it gives FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, risk authority over public and private energy facilities. Again, there has to be a national emergency. Second thing, it gives legal cover to a lot of the information that right now is the public domain, but it's not going to be FOIAble. FOIAble means Freedom of Information Act. Other thing that it does, it allows owners, operators, and users to recover costs of compliance. So if you're a municipal utility, you're going to basically put that in your ratepayer base, like water. Uh, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> folks that are doing that already. If you're basically an IOU, an investor-owned utility, you're going to put that into your ratepayer base as well as your shareholders. Second act that's coming 
and this one is hasn't gone through both houses or committee yet. It's called the Protecting Cyberspace as a National Asset Act. And it's, this one's interesting, and you can see basically what it does. Um, basically, risk-based prioritization of assets. There'll be a cyber office in, in the White House. And one of the most controversial, it gives the president under a national emergency a web kill switch. And a lot of folks basically uh, <laughs> are, uh, have a lot of qualms about this one. The last act is called the National Cyber Infrastructure Act of 2010. This one basically deals with SCADA. The acronym is called Perfect Citizen, probably a bad choice. But it's basically run out of NSA, National Security, uh, part of DOD, Department of Defense. And it basically gives NSA the authority, if it's passed, uh, under a national emergency, the ability to control a lot of the assets. In the meantime, passively, it gives NSA the ability to look at uh, incoming streams of data into critical infrastructures. Uh, but again, all three acts deal with risk. So let's look at what the energy sector is looking at their solution to manage and mitigate the risks. This was a survey that was done in December. NYU conducted a survey and essentially it said there's going to be a lot more emerging threats and vulnerabilities, much of which in the energy sector is not well understood. And there needs to be a mechanism by which to uh, mitigate that. So we developed this uh, graph figure. And it has two lines. The top line is the CIP enterprise project project complexity, complexity is increasing almost exponentially. Why? A lot of the SCADA controls that you see in utilities uh, are 40 years old. They've had patches basically put into them. And a lot of folks are uh, still trying to figure out how to integrate those patches so they can comply with NERC SIP requirements. In the meantime, utilities haven't upgraded their technical and engineering capabilities. Now with these three statutes coming out this month, we have a big risk gap. Utilities that are part of CIP have to comply. They have to comply to NERC SIP. Fines are a million dollars a day. Uh, if it ever hits a local paper that they have vulnerable controls or cyber mechanisms or CIP, uh, chances are the reputational risk is their company could go and uh, <laughs> could suffer some type of reputational loss. So here we have a gap and the gap is increasing. The gap is between CIP complexity and the compliance and then we have current uh, capabilities that the utilities have or quite often don't have. Interestingly, the feds, again, own 15% of CIP. Harris Corporation, a couple months ago, about four months ago, had a job off uh, opening in the D.C. area. It required, essentially, a top secret clearance with a full poly, with a full polygraph. And I was wondering, boy, that's interesting, because uh, <laughs> Uh, how many people really want to have the feds basically intrude into their life with a full poly? Well, the word on the street is, with these three laws, we're going to see the same thing over on the commercial side on most SIP. And I think that's going to be um, uh, coming down the pike very, very quickly. So in the meantime, I've gotten a couple questions, so I'll try to address those. Um, yes. Um, Talib is an adjunct professor at NYU. Uh, that's absolutely right. We already have drones. Uh, yes, we do on the border. I was working with the FAA when they actually were trying to put up three drones, uh, UAVs, and the feds basically, that in this case here was the uh, FAA, Really wanted to, really did not want to give them access to a certain type of airspace. Why? Again, public safety. 
but there is a possibility we'll have some of that in the future. Uh, Matt, most power plants are con controlled at access areas under the Coast Guard DHS. Yes, right now power plants, the nukes, are come under both NERC-SIP as well as uh, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Those rules for access as well as controls of the of the rods are being renegotiated and new standards are being developed. Uh, smart grid standards are being developed under the NIST 800s. And we can talk about that again. Is the kill, web kill switch the current law of the land? No, it's not. Uh, that's the big issue right now confronting a lot of folks. Um, First Amendment rights folks say, no, we don't want to have NSA have, <laughs> have the ability, legislative ability, to listen to what's going on. And NSA is essentially responding, well, these are critical assets. They deal with public safety. They deal with national security. Uh, we need to have legislative access to that traffic, those packets coming into those facilities. And um, another comment here is... Um, Full compliance for NERC SIP was required last year from Brian McKay. Uh, actually, for NERC SIP, the first 13 requirements, as of about three weeks ago, about uh, two months ago, NERC basically layered, put down a new hammer, basically requiring new forms of assurance. And we could talk about that in a couple minutes. And uh, Matt Nissen basically says yes, the NSA applications with a polygraph can be very, very tough. Um, absolutely right. I think a lot of the people who are in this webinar understand this and <laughs> uh, understand the significance of it. And I think that fact is, uh, and by the way, somebody mentioned that my voice is clipping. Uh, did you remove your headset? No, I didn't. <laughs> so hopefully it's not from my end, but um, Headset is basically where it's been for the last half an hour or so, or 35 minutes. Anyway, let me march through these because I've got a number of slides that I want to cover. Um, in the power industry, that gap that we see on this slide between complexity and current capabilities, the feds, meaning NIST, NERC, which is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation basically say we're going to use ERM as our model to close that gap. So what's ERM? ERM, this is the, the common definition of ERM, Enterprise Risk Management. It's basically a process that starts at the board level. It's ex executed by management and by um, lower level folks. It focuses on strategy. It basically is designed to identify potential events. Um, could be vulnerabilities, it could be risks, and um, basically to manage those within the risk appetite. Interestingly, and we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, um, where the feds are looking for perfect, absolute assurance. There ain't no such thing in cybersecurity. So the best we can really do is reasonable assur assurance. And again, technically, uh, we can talk about that. Okay, uh, I guess the clipping has disappeared, so that's good. So, the next slide. According to the survey that was done last uh, December, enterprise risk management is the framework that the electric utilities are adopting to manage risks, to comply with the new requirements, and to basically to terms of setting up their SCADA systems and their control systems. And we'll talk about that. This is NERC's, and again, NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. This is their vision for all transmission and largely generation in North America. The common element, and I'm not going to read this whole slide, the common element is risk-informed decision-making, risk identification of vulnerabilities, and risk controls to mitigate those security risks or vulnerabilities. 
So let's talk about the three areas of SIP compliance. And again, compliance can be statutory, it could be FERC, it could be NERC, it could be <laughs> NSA. But there's really three elements. And those three elements really encompass the critical areas of compliance. Governance, technology governance, risk management, enterprise risk management, and assurance. And we'll spend a couple minutes discussing each of those. Now, why are we focusing on that? Traditional management, meaning compliance management, has been reactive. There's a vulnerability, there's a crash, there's an intrusion, and then basically the organization jumps through hoops and responds to that. Again, that's reactive. The essence of enterprise risk management are what we call the four Ps. We want to be proactive, preventive, predictive, and preemptive. Okay, put down predictive twice. But anyway, the fourth P is preemptive. And the interesting thing is that the new statutes, the new laws, the new standards coming out of NIST, they're all adopting the four P's model. So let's talk about three frameworks that are out there for ERM. The first one is the COSO. And COSO stands, it's essentially came out of the financial area. And it's really interesting to look at this, what we would call the box on the right-hand side. It consists of eight elements, looking at from the internal environment to risk uh, assessment, risk controls, and then monitoring. It covers really four areas, strategic operations, reporting, compliance. And by the way, you can Google this and get some information on COSO. Just Google COSO ERM and you'll get probably thousands if not millions of hits. The second framework, and again the framework is a structure. It's a structure of looking at risk. It's uh, also a guidance document and it's a controls document. Uh, one, the one that came out probably about nine months ago is ISO 31000. Um, if you need, <laughs> unfortunately, you have to buy 31000 I don't know how much it costs, but it's probably in the $50, $100 range. If you Google ISO 31000 FDIS, which is the uh, final draft international standard, FDIS, you'll be able to get the copy of the ISO standard right before it went and became public. So I've got a couple questions here from folks. Um, yes, they hire us consultants to take care of the risk. That's very interesting. Last year in NERC SIP, we had probably half of our customers that called us initially wanting us to sign off on the risk for compliance. We our company has been talking to hundreds of utilities through American Public Power Association, Northwest Public Power Association, basically saying to the utilities, you can't sign away compliance to a third party. At the end of the day, the feds, FERC, NRC, is basically going to come to you and you still own that risk. You can't abdicate that responsibility. Um, Another question that I have here is, should we trust an ERM model that has failed? Uh, that's a really good question. There are a number of ERM models. A lot of them, these are the three major ones that we're going to talk about today. Have they failed? Yes. But since one is the international standard, one's a NIST standard, and another one is basically adopted by the SEC. These are probably the best ones out there. They, again, the threshold is not absolute assurance. It's reasonableness. And that's a legal threshold for almost any type of risk program. Uh, and especially if you're dealing with cybersecurity or controls. <laughs> cybersecurity, by definition, is poor as a Swiss cheese. You can't provide absolute assurance. All you can do is reasonableness. And the other thing is, another question I got from Mr. Rausch is, 
How does the casualty actuarial profession fit into the scope of your discussion? It's a very good That's a very good question. About four associations or four professions, including the Society of Actuaries, um, as is, Fiscal Security, uh, possibly ASQ, American Society of Quality, they're all rebranding. What do I mean? Uh, a lot of them are becoming ERM organizations. So what you've seen is the actuaries, for example, they've just, just uh, developed their own body of knowledge around ERM. Uh, the same way with as is, which is the Fiscal Security Professional Association, and several others, uh, RIMS, Risk Insurance Management Society, they have adopted ERM. Uh, <laughs> how do we know that? Well, uh, we own, we have the trademark for Certified Enterprise Risk Manager. So we're basically deploying that. So there's been a lot of competition and some, well, I would say some collaboration in terms of developing ERM frameworks. Very, again, very good questions. The third framework, ERM framework, is called the NIST 800s, 837. Uh, and you can see it in front of you. Uh, it's a little bit, <laughs> I want to go back to this framework for a second, the ISO framework, because it's interesting. ISO frameworks such as 9000, General Quality Management System, 14000, Environmental Management System, 28000, Supply Management System, uh, 27,000 uh, <laughs> information systems management. All of them follow the same type of what I would call plan, do, check, check, act model that you see on the right hand side. It's a common framework for almost all ISO standards. And again, you can basically pick that one off, off the web by Googling FDIS Final Draft International Standards 31,000. This standard, by the way, NIST 837 is the federal framework that the feds are recommending. Uh, this was basically for IT. Uh, you can Google NIST 837 and you can pull it off the web. It's free. And it's a really good framework. Interestingly, it can be used for SIP, communications, uh, controls, and cybersecurity. So it's a very good framework. I could probably spend hours on any one of these. I have another question. Where does the ERM factor factor into restrictions on deep water drilling? Is there any evidence that ERM has been performed presented regarding deep water drilling? Good, very good question by Mr. McQuaid. Um, a couple years ago, the services are basically, when I say services, uh, specifically the Navy. The Navy has a program called OPM. You can Google that stands for Operational, uh, Operational Risk Management, ORM, excuse me. <laughs> and essentially, the Navy's program is, says that every sailor is going to go through a risk management uh, program. Just like I think one of my, our tenets is uh, the filter for any type of decision making, either from an individual, public policy, or from a technical, is going to be filtered through the prism of risk. Well, the Navy has already picked that up. The question is, have the Coast Guard picked that up? I don't know. But I know that some of my consulting compatriots at other very large companies, risk management companies, are working with the Coast Guard in the Gulf, basically doing risk management on this very issue. Again, good questions. So let me give you an example of what an ERM, very simple ERM, analysis looks like. This is what we would call a, uh, a um, qualitative analysis. And we're looking at really two vectors, two parts of a vector, likelihood and consequence. Uh, in terms of the likelihood of an occurrence, we're looking at really five values that we're looking at probabilistically from a highly probable event, 75% to an improbable event. And by the way, FAA for their next gen, next generation, is using ERM. Uh, NASA is already using that. So the federal agencies largely, to almost all federal agencies, are using a very similar 
qualitative model. Our other vector, part of the vector, is the severity, consequence of impact. Again, we're looking at catastrophic down to negligible with values of 1 to 5. So basically what we get is a heat chart or a risk profile. And you can see that as likelihood increases as well as impact consequence, if you multiply those two, we get a color-coded chart, green, yellow, and red, with a higher consequence and higher impact and higher likelihood things being in the red zone. And here's two examples of uh, what I would call a, a <laughs> risk map. One is the Hydro One risk map on the left-hand side, and for some reason it got a little bit large, but you can get the basic idea. Probability in one axis and consequence on the other, and it goes from green to the lower left corner to a deep red on the upper. And then on the right-hand side, we have the same thing, but this is interesting. It's basically the impact risk of, um, of various types of particle or debris hitting the International Space Station. And you can basically look at the different parts of the space station color-coded from green, yellow, blue, and you know the various types of impacts. And again, blue, low risk, green, middle, medium risk, and high, obviously, red risk. So who's using the ERM model? Well, the FA, Safety Management System, FDA, Good Manufacturing Practices, OMB with FISMA. FISMA is a requirement of all IT systems in the federal space. FISMA stands for Federal Information Security Management Act. U.S. Navy is using it with their operational risk management, and FDA is using it with food safety. Uh, for what we're talking about in this workshop, the large, the acts, the federal, <laughs> the federal laws are going to be probably implemented this summer, dealing with smart grid, cybersecurity, and controls. Risk is the essential element to all of those. Risk in terms of identifying the uh, vulnerabilities and two, finally controlling and mitigating the risks. And then the standards coming out of ISO, NIST, IEC, largely are risk-based as well. Okay, Mr. McQuaid uh, asks, has another good, good, great question. I'm puzzled by the likelihood categories. Less than 10% was the lowest. And it's interesting. When you look at the categories at the FAA for the SMS, Safety Management System, or if you look at NASA or NSA, they use essentially the same charts, but the probabilities can change. And there's a lot more stuff that can be done with those, but it's a very good question. So it's not so much the numbers as coming up with an understanding of what the risks can be. So final section, ERM lessons learned. Compliance to a statute in terms of, well, it's interesting. In the sectors that we've been talking about, compliance was just simply having the necessary documentation. If you had a documentation of a uh, coop, a, <laughs> um, a business uh, uh, a continuity program, or a business management program, or a continuity, business continuity program, that would normally suffice. But what we're seeing right now, especially with the rulings coming out of the feds, uh, FERC specifically in the last two weeks, Compliance, just simply having paperwork, isn't good enough. Now they're focusing on the effectiveness of the system, the effectiveness of the documentation. In the old days for compliance, it was do as you say, say as you do. Now the threshold of due diligence or reasonableness is higher. The threshold is effectiveness. Do you have the right system in place? Is it working effectively? And oh, by the way, is it going to basically monitor and catch the vulnerabilities on a 4P basis. Proactive, preventive, predictive, and the preventive. So let's look at, and what this is what I would call SIP technology governance. And this is one of the job opportunities for engineers. The drivers are obviously statutory. The solutions that we're seeing are technical risk-based standards. 
Why is this so critical for us to be part of the solution? Is with BP and with Toyota, we weren't, we didn't have access and we didn't communicate it to the executive levels. And we need to, we as a profession. Why? Because breaches can impact public safety, non compliance can result in vulnerabilities, violations are material, and NERC SIP fines, for example, can be a million dollars a day. And the violations can result in dilution of brand equity and reputational risk. Risk management. The drivers are again the feds. The solutions are CIP, risk controls. We need to use one of those three frameworks or a comparable framework that we discussed earlier. Uh, the approach is we need to focus not at the transactional or product level, but also the programmatic process and finally the enterprise level. This is interesting, and this is one of the things that we're seeing a lot, almost daily. I'm getting a phone call from someone. SIP assurance used to be compliance. So you can see that on the, on the figure on the right-hand side. Compliance largely was a yes-no, do as you say, say as you do audit. FERC and the feds are saying that's not good enough. We need to have yellow book compliance it has to demonstrate effectiveness. And <laughs> that an effectiveness in Yellow Book, basically, which is what the statutes re refer to, are engineers. We need three things to demonstrate effectiveness. One, the right people doing the audits. Two, the right people doing the audits the right way, meaning a auditing standard that they're following. And three, we need to have the right standards to which they're auditing against. So the feds have basically decided that the audits are going to be yellow book. They're going to basically audit against the NIST 800 series. And the auditors, and this is right now a big issue, uh, we've been in front of Homeland Security, FBI, and a number, one of, a number of agencies. We've even get given testimony that the people who should be conducting these audits should be engineers trained specialists. Now the question is, does an IT specialist, non-technical person, meet the threshold of due diligence or due professional care? Our response is, would you bet your company on that? <laughs> and our tagline is, would you trust an engineer to attest your financials? Probably not. So let's use a corollary. Would you trust a CPA firm or a non-professional to attest to attest the effectiveness of, say, SCADA controls. So I have another question here. Um, at its core, risk management, risk management requires creativity. The ability to envision all the possible, perhaps unlikely, but nevertheless catastrophic events to consider. How is that cre creativity taught or otherwise achieved? Very good question. Uh, I think a lot of people, especially with these statutes coming out, being enacted, and especially with the consequences, uh, horrendous consequences for the company that doesn't comply and demonstrate effectiveness. Um, legally, the def legally, the requirement of reasonableness would be three things. One, did the right people conduct the audit? and attest to the system's effectiveness. Two, did they follow a well-known procedure to conduct the assessment? And three, did they basically rely on a good standard to which they audited against? My answer, the standards to which they audited against hopefully should be an ISO standard, a COSO standard, or a uh, NIST 800 standard. The second thing is, uh, who should conduct the audits? Uh, well, that's what we do for a living. That's why we have that good housekeeping stamp of approval from DHS. It does require a standard methodology. And the third is who should do it? We believe that specialists. If we're doing a bio facility, which we can, uh, we would basically rely upon the guidance and wisdom of a PhD chemist, PhD biologist. But that's a very good question. So here's the engineering opportunities that I think is the bottom line to this uh, webinar. 
and thank you for your patience again. <laughs> um, the new statutes are going to create lots of opportunities for SIP cybersecurity and smart grid engineers. Two, these are driven by statute and regs. In other words, the work won't disappear. It won't be outsourced. Three, there's high barriers to entry. Uh, again, going back to my comment, would you trust an engineer to attest your financials? Obviously, no. That person would have to be a CPA. From our point of view, um, we basically have worked with almost all the federal agencies saying that engineers and scientists have to do that work. Um, well, the, this work won't be outsourced. Pub, it deals with public safety. It's going to be domestic. And um, it's got good great pay. There is basically a very low supply and there's a high technical demand. So I think those are the reasons why if I were an engineer mid-career or even late in my career, it would be very worthwhile my investment. Well, obviously, this is what we do for a living, <laughs> to basically do SIP work. Again, driven by statute, high barriers to entry, it can't be outsourced, and it's got good pay. So again, one of the questions that I got on the side here, um, <laughs> I got some good editorial comments that I'll address in a minute. Uh, ERM tools. What we're going to do, we have a consortium of Northwest Utilities that have asked us to do uh, monthly webinars on the risk standards, the NIST 800s, and that's what we plan to do. And we might do those through IEEE. And, <laughs> and uh, there's 3,400 utilities in the country that simply aren't ready for this, believe me. And uh, let's see, your next steps. Okay, uh, one. Understand the new SIP requirements and cyber opportunities and job requirements. Two, uh, do an uh, intense personal risk assessment of where you are in terms of your personal career, work, and job capabilities. Do a gap analysis in one and two, <coughs> and then develop a plan. Figure out what you need. If you want to basically play in that new space or the emerging space, figure out what you need to do to uh, mitigate your career risks on the downside and amplify your risks on the high side, meaning uh, monetize the upside opportunities. Um, and at the end of the day, you've got five options. I um, mean, you've got four options. You can stay where you are. You can develop new technical capabilities to complement your current ones. You can develop, learn risk management, or you can do all of the above. So I know I've taken 61 minutes and <laughs> I've basically done the workshop. So I've got a couple editorials here and I guess I'll address some of them here as well as I can. I disagree with your comments about the CPA firms. Okay, the big four CPA firms are Ernst & Young, Price Waterhouse, uh, Ernst and Young and who else? Uh, KPMG. They basically have been very careful about getting into the space, largely because of liability, as well as the other firms. Um, we were the first ones at Homeland Security three, four years ago, dealing with the issue of liability. Um, for example, a lot of the folks, the feds are simply saying, you have to demonstrate effectiveness to the reasonable reasonableness level. And a lot of the CPA firms, and a lot of large engineering firms like CH, Parsons, um, they don't want to touch this. Too much risk. Meaning you're betting your company if there is a uh, <laughs> if there is an intrusion or some type of event. Um, well, another question that we received, will those risk standards webinars be publicly available free? through IEEE. How can we learn about them if so? Good question. Uh, <laughs> we've basically been working on the on the demand side. We've had about 160 utilities, possibly maybe even a couple thousand utilities have expressed interest in these webinars. Uh, what is the cost of those? Probably the first ones will be gratis. I don't know what that's going to look like in the future, so we don't know about that yet. But we'll try to make them available, publicly available. Um, Kevin, there is already a system set up for auditing NERC SIP standards. 
who, what, how train, still being developed, improved audits and standards. Um, boy, no, there isn't. We just did a peer review of one of the regional organizations and they didn't meet the intent letter and intent of the new FERC requirements. So that's going to be a big issue this summer and fall in terms of how will the audits be conducted. Presently, the regional organizations, WEC, MRO, Texas, are basically conducting NERC SIP, well, <laughs> NERC -SIP audits doing peer compliance. They're not doing effect in this yellow book. Um, and then two months ago, NERC SIP came up with a new ruling that says, hey, stop uh, <laughs> using their term, NERC's ter uh, using uh, FERC's terms, stop down balloting the effectiveness and the intent of our requirements. So that's still in debate. Um, please do continue these webinars through IEEE. I hope so, David, Mr. Kelly, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Kevin. Another person said, I enjoyed your presentation, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyway, uh, if you've got questions, uh, please put it in your chat box. And I've got about five more minutes, and I'll address all of them. Thanks, folks, for attending. I appreciate it, your time. <laughs> Any questions? Type them. <laughs> I thought I've addressed a lot of them in the chat piece. I mean, this is what we do for a living, and I think... <laughs> I think uh, I, we're probably as knowledgeable, or probably, we're probably the most knowledgeable people in the country on this stuff, because we've been advising the feds on this as well. Okay, uh, 30 seconds go by. It's five minutes after the hour. Uh, a couple other people have said thanks. So I appreciate that. Please fill in your um, the survey. Uh, again, you're the customer. We want to hear from you. Uh, our job and what we are doing this for is we want to create jobs for engineers. We want you to be employable. Again, this issue of we had a CPA firm about six months ago came up to us and said, hey, we want to get into NERC SIP. We want to make a lot of money doing these audits. And I essentially I told the partner of this firm, you're basically going to base <laughs> it wasn't as probably as abrupt as this, but I basically said, do you really want to bet your firm on a bad decision. And this was a medium-sized firm, about 1,200 people. And the guy said, no, I guess not. So they pulled out of this market. So the three things that engineers need to do is, one, get trained. Two, got to follow this common methodology for conducting the audits. And three, understand <laughs> what are the standards out there to which you're going to audit against, ISO, NIST or IEC, whatever the standards are, follow that standard. Because if you're ever litigated on for lack of due diligence or lack of professional care, your defense will be, I follow that standard. Okay, listen, uh, I guess I'm being dismissed. So uh, thank you so much. And if you have questions, Helen, are we through? Hi, are we through? Yes, we are. Okay, I'm dismissed. Yes. Okay. Well, you're my boss. Thank you. You're my boss. How did it go? <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, come on. Tell me. Where... Thank you, participants. Where could... Thank you, participants. Yes, thank you. Oh, they're online. They're hearing this. <laughs> okay. If... <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs>